February 1967 seemed to be the month when psychedelia took the British scene by storm. And March saw the release of some classic singles from that era. Here are some cool British singles from March 1967. March 1967 saw the release of Pink Floyd's debut single. Arnold Lane was recorded at Sound Technique Studios in Chelsea, and it was produced by Joe Boyd. The B-side was Candy and a Current Bun, another excellent song that remains one of the most underrated tracks from Pink Floyd's early days. Please just fall with me. Please, you know I'm feeling frail. The press had been writing about Pink Floyd since late 1966, so the single was awaited with high expectations. The New Musical Express wrote, This is the group that creates such an impact on stage with its visual effects, flashing lights, color slides and so on. I must say that orally, this doesn't strike me as very psychedelic, but it is an unusual disc with an offbeat weird lyric and blockbusting sound. Great organ work, twangs, and a spine tingling built. With all their publicity, they could well hit with this. The flip is a jogging jaunty beat underlying fuzz guitar and mid-tempo pace. The solo is part sung part whispered with strange oscillating chanting. This is more like psychedelia. Arnold Lane was banned on Radio London due to its supposedly smutty lyrics. Roger Waters said, We don't know what Radio London are perturbed about. It's a song about a clothes fetishist who's obviously a bit kinked. It's just a very simple straightforward song about one sort of human predicament. The melody maker asked Sid Barrett about the song. Sid said, I was at Cambridge at the time I started to write the song. I pinched the line about moonshine washing line from Roger, our bass guitarist, because he has an enormous washing line in the back garden of his house. Then I thought that Arnold Lane must have a hobby, and it went from there. Arnold just happens to dig dressing up in women's clothing. A lot of people do, so let's face up to reality. The single reached number 20 on the British charts. And now a rapid return visit to Top of the Pops by a trio which is blazing a trail through Britain with exciting new sounds. With their current top 10 hits Purple Haze, here with the Jimi Hendrix Experience. March 1967 also saw the release of the second single by the Jimi Hendrix Experience. Purple Haze was recorded at D Lane Lee Studios in London and produced by Chas Chandler. At the time, Hendrix was part of one of the most bizarre package tours of 1967. The tour featured a lineup consisting of Hendrix, the Walker Brothers, Cat Stevens and Engelbert Humperdinck. The single got excellent reviews in the press. The New Musical Express wrote, Mean insidious cloying rhythm and blues, the sort of stuff we rarely hear produced in this country. Jimmy's guttural voice gives out in impassioned style, carried along by a nagging thump beat. And behind him, there's just about the most startling guitar work you've ever heard opening in bluesy style and building up almost to the psychedelic. Not a great deal of melody, but boy, what an impact. Not everyone's cup of tea of course, but it's bound to make the charts. The Melody Maker wrote, It's a great record full of atmosphere and excitement with the dynamic Hendrix personality shining from every groove. If there's any justice in this world, it will be a top 10 hit. The Melody Maker also asked Paul McCartney to give his verdict on the single. McCartney said, I thought it would be a thing that people might keep down. But it's breaking all over. You can't stop it. Hooray. I really don't know whether it's as commercial as Hey Joe or Stone Free. I bet it is though, probably will be. Fingers Hendrix, an absolute ace on the guitar. This is yet another incredible record from the great Hendrix. The single reached number three on the British charts, and it was also a top 10 hit in several European countries. In the States, it stalled at number 65 according to Billboard. The Move released one of their greatest singles in March 1967. This was the band's second single after the success of their first 45, Night of Fear, which reached number two in the UK singles chart. The song, which was written by Roy Wood, highlighted the great talents of that early classic lineup of the band. Apart from the brilliant harmonies, the tune featured three members of the band singing lead vocals during different parts of the song. Yeah, 
At the time, the move were constantly featured in the press. Their controversial live shows, in which the band smashed television sets and even cars, probably helped them get some extra attention. But the British press already hailed Roy Wood as one of the most promising songwriters of the new wave of British bands that were emerging at the time. Journalist Penny Valentine reviewed the single for Disc magazine. Penny Valentine wrote, Here then is a record that the move can be judged on, not like that last thing that was such a huge hit. A record much more representative of the group, and great. Producer Denny Cordell has even put in some grass growing sounds like rain falling into an empty tin. There's something reminiscent of the birds about the sound and this is going to go down hugely in America. The title is a real gem. The chorus is super, a touch of real genius. Yes, I like it. The melody maker wrote, The lyrics are too much. The backing has that characteristic move power punch. And it's going to surprise a lot of people who don't dig Night of Fear. The move are going to happen. And this record could be their first number one. Beat Instrumental magazine asked Roy Wood about the song. Roy said, The title idea was given to me by a photographer friend. I thought it was a good one and wrote this song around it. It's all about a guy who's a real nutcase. Nothing at all to do with drugs. But I suppose that a few people, especially the national press, will read some deeper hidden meaning into the lyrics. The song reached number 5 in the UK singles chart. It was the second of a string of four consecutive top 5 hit singles in the UK. March 1967 saw the release of Jeff Beck's biggest hit, Hi Ho Silver Lining. The song has enjoyed some unexpected longevity in the UK as a wedding band staple and a football anthem. Considered by many to be one of the most annoying songs of the 60s, Jeff Beck himself described his relation to this track as having a pink toilet seat hanging round my neck for the rest of my f***ing life. The B-side of the single, however, was a real gem and it featured an all-star lineup consisting of Keith Moon on drums, Jimmy Page on guitar, John Paul Jones on bass, and Nicky Hopkins on piano. The melody maker asked Jeff Beck about the single. Beck said, The B-side is more my cup of tea. It's an instrumental bolero based on Ravel. Very timid compared to Ravel. I got the A-side three months ago in the States. It's commercial and I want to sell records. Jimi Hendrix was quite impressed by the song. The Melody Maker reported, Among Jimmy's favorite singles at present is the flip side of the new Jeff Beck record, a number called Beck's Bolero. Beautiful guitar, Jimmy commented. Hi Ho Silver Lining was a top 20 hit in Britain in 1967, and it was a top 20 hit again when it was re-released in 1972. Wonder why we got to keep the love in the dark. Oddly enough, The Attack also released Hi Ho Silver Lining as a single in March 1967. Their version of the song actually came out a week before Jeff Beck's single. However, the highlight here was the B-side, featuring some incredible guitar work by David Olis. Even though the single never charted, the B-side became quite popular at the time. John Peel loved the song so much that he used it as the signature tune of his performed garden radio show on Radio London, which helped increase the popularity of the band. And David Olist's guitar didn't go unnoticed. John Mayall heard the song on Radio London and was so impressed by his guitar playing that he asked him to replace Peter Green in the Blues Breakers. The guitarist passed on the offer however, and Future Stones guitarist Mick Taylor got the gig instead. Later in 1967, David Olist formed The Nice along with Keith Emerson. I Can't Make It was the last Small Faces single before leaving Decca for immediate records, and it was seen as a bit of a disappointment. It was a good song and as usual, it featured a strong vocal performance by Marriott. But it didn't seem to have the same instant appeal that their previous singles had and it sounded more like an album track than singles material. The song stalled at number 26 and it was considered a flop. The fact that the BBC decided to ban the record due to the supposedly sexual nature of the lyrics didn't help matters. Beat Instrumental magazine asked Steve Marriott about the song. Marriott said, We've been fortunate with the record scene so far. 
we were bound to get a flop sooner or later. At least it proves that people are buying our records for the right reasons. They choose the ones they like the sound of, and reject the others. They aren't going out and buying them blindly, or just because they like the look of it. There's nothing to say, it's all been said. March 1967 also saw the release of this single by The Zombies, one of the most criminally underrated British bands of the 60s. This was the last single they released for Decca Records before signing to CBS. The A-side was a cover of Going Out of My Head by Little Anthony and the Imperials. It was a decent cover, but a poor choice for a single, especially in 1967. Just like many singles released that year, the highlight here was the B-side. She Does Everything For Me was an excellent song written by Rod Argent. The guitar melody had some psychedelic overtones, and it definitely would have made more sense to release this song as the top side. Considering the track was actually recorded in early 1966, it's remarkable that it still sounded quite fresh and not terribly outdated in March 1967. Unfortunately, just like all their 1967 releases, it was a flop. Anyone there? Anyone there? Another 1967 single whose highlight was the B-side was this 45 by the Montanas, who were formed in Wolverhampton in 1964. Anyone There was an excellent psychedelic track which has been featured on several psych compilations over the years. The song even featured a great Yardbirds style rave up with all the cool guitar effects you'd expect from 1967. The top side was completely different in both style and approach. Chow Baby was a decent enough pop tune whose melody was slightly reminiscent of bands like The Zombies. Baby, let's call it a day. Even though it didn't chart, the single got lots of airplay on pirate radio stations. At the time, most pirate stations had their own top 40, which usually included songs that they felt could become hits. Chow Baby was in the top positions of a couple of pirate stations charts and it was written by Scott English and Larry Weiss, who scored a major hit with the previously mentioned Hi-Ho Silver Lining. But the song didn't enter the British charts. The exceptions were a Birmingham band who released seven singles between 1965 and 1969. The Eagle Flies on Friday was one of their best. The band only managed to get a couple of small reviews in the press, although most were fairly positive. Record Mirror wrote, The title means simply that it's payday. It has a pronounced rhythm and blues flavor with a hypnotic beat. Irritated treatment, heavy beat, and a sound that grips. The group has potential. Despite getting some airplay on Radio London, the single failed to chart. As a curious note, future Led Zeppelin vocalist Robert Plant, who was a good friend of the group, hitched a ride down to London with the band and played tambourine on the track. Probably due to the fact that they were constantly touring the States, the influence of the Yardbirds was more prominently heard on American bands than on British bands. Certainly, many of the American garage rock and psychedelic bands featured on compilations such as Nuggets or Pebbles sounded like they owed a huge debt to the Yardbirds. The Drag Set, who were formed in southwest London in the mid-60s, were one of the few British bands from 1967 who were strongly influenced by the Yardbirds. Not surprisingly, this Killer 45 from March 1967 is very reminiscent of the sort of material that many American bands were putting out at the time. The Drag Set, changed their name to The Open Mind shortly after releasing this single. The Open Mind's self-titled album has become a highly sought-after collectible over the years, and their song The Magic Potion has also become a cult classic among fans of British psychedelia from the late 60s. This single, just like many other great singles from that era, failed to chart. My girl and me We build a dream and last but not least, The Flies were a band from Kilburn who released three singles between 1966 and 1968. House of Love was their second single, and it was produced by Ivor Raymond, who also produced artists like Dusty Springfield. 
The band's previous single, released in 1966, was a great slowed down cover of I'm Not Your Stepping Stone. Probably one of the best covers ever released of the song. House of Love was an excellent track that seemed to merge mod sounds with the emerging psychedelia from that era. It was well written and well produced and it had a great catchy chorus. It probably could have been a hit if it had been backed by good promotion. The song, however, was barely reviewed in the press. Penny Valentine wrote, House of Love by The Flies is about how he and his girl built this room. I feel there is some significance in this. There is much about it that reminds me of the small faces. Despite the lack of chart success, the band managed to appear at the 14th hour Technicolor Dream, the famous happening that was held in the Great Hall of the Alexandra Palace in London on the 29th of April. I hope you enjoyed this trip back to March 1967. See you next time.